Greetings from my side. I am Dr. Vivek Kumar Sharma, working as Dean, Professor and Head in the Department of Physiology, Government Institute of Medical Sciences in Greater Noida, UP. So today we, I am going to take a lecture on the physiology of thyroid gland. Introduction. Thyroid gland maintains the level of the metabolism for the optimal functioning. And although thyroid gland is not essential for life, but absence causes various types of the metabolic disorders, mental retardation, growth and the development issues. Thyroid gland is placed in the front of the neck and it has two lobes, the right and the left lobe, which are connected together by the isthmus. Physiologic anatomy. Thyroid tissue is present in all vertebrates and develops at third week of the gestation. In mammals, it originates from the evagination of the floor of the pharynx. So, lobes are connected by the thyroid isthmus and sometimes from this isthmus, there is origin of another lobe that is the pyramidal lobe. The thyroid gland is one of the most well vascularized gland in the body and it has one of the highest rates of the blood flow per gram of the tissue of any organ in the body. Histology. Now this thyroid gland is made up of the multiple acini or the follicles and they can be present either in the active secretion state or the inactive state. In the inactive follicle, what do we see is that in the center, which is the center proteinaceous material called as the colloid, it is abundant. We see that these follicles are larger in size and the cells that are lining this follicle are flat and they are quite thin layered. Whereas when we see it, compare it with the active follicle, we find that the cells over here are the columnar or cuboidal and the colloid is lesser in nature. And we also see this resorption lacunae. These resorption lacunae are produced because this colloid is being utilized by the for the synthesis of the thyroid hormones and these are being reabsorbed into the thyroid cells. Apart from that, there is also presence of the parafollicular cells. Parafollicular cells are involved in the synthesis of the, uh, of the calcitonin hormone. Now, the, primarily there are two major hormones that are secreted by the thyroid gland. These are the thyroxine, that is T4, and isomer is in the normal situation produced. Then there is triiodothyronin or T3, which is the most active form of the thyroid hormone. Then there is also production of another hormone that is reverse T3 or RT3 that is inactive in nature. Then these thyroid hormones, they have the they are formed by the linkage between two iodotyrosine molecules or they are the iodine derivatives of tyrosine. The parafollicular cells will produce the calcitonin hormone that is involved primarily in the calcium metabolism. Now, Formation and secretion of the thyroid hormones. This T4 is the 3,5,3-5- tetraiodothyronine, and T3 is 3,5,3-triiodothyronine. Both these are iodine derivatives of the thyronine, and they are produced by the condensation product of two molecules of amino acid tyrosine. Both these thyroid hormones are synthesized and stored as a part of the thyroglobulin molecule. Iodine metabolism is very important and very crucial for the production of the thyroid hormones and as it is an essential raw material, normal intake of iodine is roughly 500 micrograms per day and the minimum requirement per day is roughly around 150 micrograms per day. And the total body content of iodine is roughly 30 to 50 milligrams, out of which nearly 20% or one-fifth is located within the thyroid gland itself. Coming to the iodine metabolism, the principal organs that take up the iodine or iodide are the thyroid and kidney, and also we can consider liver. In a daily uh, intake, we have roughly 500 micrograms per day. A normal plasma iodine level is roughly 0.3 micrograms per, m per liter. So this 500 micrograms, it is out of which 120 micrograms of iodide is taken up by the thyroid gland. And uh, then out of which 80 micrograms is utilized for the synthesis and secretion of the thyroid hormones. Then it comes for to the liver for the met after the metabolic activity has occurred. And then it is secreted either in the bile or in the urine. And in this way, out of 500 micrograms, we see 
that nearly 480 micrograms is excreted in the urine. Relation of thyroid function to the iodide is very unique because iodide is although essential for the normal thyroid function but iodide deficiency and as well as the iodide excess both will inhibit the thyroid function. Now coming to the thyroglobulin which is essentially the most important component of this colloid. It is present in the colloid and it functions as the source of the tyrosine from which the thyroid hormone will be produced and the thyroid hormone synthesis occurs on the thyroglobulin itself. So now let's see what thyroglobulin is. Thyroglobulin is a glycoprotein 660 kilodalton that is synthesized by the thyroid cells and secreted by the exocytosis of the granules into the colloid that also contain thyroid peroxidase. So that means that the cells over here, thyroid cells are going to produce the thyroglobulin and they will secrete it over here and along with that there will be the secretion of a very important enzyme thyroid peroxidase that helps in the synthesis and secretion of the thyro thyroid hormones. Thyroglobulin contains nearly 123 tyrosine residues but only 4 to 8 are incorporated in the hormones. Thyroid hormones are synthesized in the colloid by the iodination and the condensation of the tyrosine molecules that are bound to the peptide linkage in the thyroglobulin. What are the functions of the thyroid gland? They collect and transport iodine. They synthesize the thyroglobulin and secrete it into the colloid. They add iodine to the thyroglobulin to synthesize the thyroid hormones. They remove the thyroid hormones from the thyroglobulin and secrete them into the circulation. So let's now see how the thyroid hormone synthesis occurs. So there are multiple steps. The number one step is iodide trapping. Whatever the iodine is taken, it is absorbed by the cells in the form of the iodide. So first step is the iodide trapping. How does it occur? It occurs by the secondary active transport and the primarily it is being done by the sodium iodide symporter that is located on the basolateral membrane of the follicular cell. So iodide is present, it comes from the circulation and then it comes into the uh, thyroid cell. In the thyroid cell, what do we see? That when the TSH thyroid stimulating hormone stimulates the thyroid cell, it stimulates the functioning on the basolateral membrane of this sodium iodide symport pump that tries that takes the iodide against the electrochemical gradient and then from there it crosses the thyroid cell and passively via this pendrin chloride iodide exchanger it goes into the colloid. So thyroid gland concentrates 100 times or maybe more as compared to the plasma level of the level of the iodide. Second step is the oxidation and the iodination that is also called as the organification. So we can divide it into 2A where there is oxidation of the iodide to iodine. So it occurs at the apical surface of the follicular cells and it is catalyzed by thyroid peroxidase or TPO. So for this, the, after this the iodine enters into the colloid and the transport as we have just seen in the previous slide it is mediated by the pendrin chloride iodide exchanger. So iodide comes, active transport occurs through the cell and then from the cells it comes into the colloid. In the colloid on the apical surface there is location of this enzyme TPO or thyroid peroxidase that oxidizes this iodide and converts it into the iodinium or hypoiodous acid or the enzyme bound hypoiodite and these compounds are these which are produced here now they can combine with the thyroglobulin and they can give rise to the synthesis of the MIT or DIT that is the monoiodotyrosine or the diiodotyrosine. In monoiodotyrosine there is iodination on the third position of the tyrosine and in the DIT the next iodination will occur on the fifth position of the tyrosine and these steps are catalyzed by the thyroid peroxidase. So these will result in the formation of the iodotyrosines that is the monoiodotyrosine and the diiodotyrosine. So this is the organification step or the iodination step. 
Then we get into the third that is the coupling reaction. In the coupling reaction, what happens that this MIT and DIT, they couple together to give rise to the T3 on T4 or the triadothyronine and tetraidothyronine hormone. So when one MIT combines with one DIT, when this couples with MIT couples with DIT, it gives rise to the production of 353-triadothyronine that is T3. When two DIT molecules, they combine or couple together, they will give rise to 353-5-tetraidothyronine molecule or the T4 hormone. RT3 or the reverse T3 is produced when 3-5-triadothyronine is produced, but as we have already discussed that it is in active form. Then the fourth is this, after this synthesis of the thyroid hormones has occurred, there will be proteolysis of the thyroglobulin and the secretion of the hormones. So these hormones are now produced and they are, in, they are bound with the thyroglobulin and they stay in the colloid. When there is need of the body to produce the thyroid and secrete it into the body, then at that time, thyroid cell, there will be the endocytosis of this thyroglobulin, which will which is having MIT, DIT and T3, T4 also coupled with it. And this endocytosis into the thyroid cell will occur. And with this endocytosis into the cell, they will then they will be acted upon now by the proteases enzyme. And this proteases are uh, proteases enzyme that are located in the lysosomes. They will they they will fuse together and then they will cause the release of this MIT, DIT, T3, and T4 hormones. They will be liberated within the thyroid cell. Now we want T3 and T4 to go into the circulation, but we do not want MIT and DIT to go into the circulation because these are these are still the only the raw forms and they they have not been they, they have not been processed to produce t3 and t4 hormone so by the uh, then this t3 and t4 hormones will go into the circulation but this mit and dit they will be acted upon by the microsomal iodotyrosine deiodinase within the thyroid cell itself and then it will liberate large amount of the iodide ions and so these iodide ions can again be reused for the production of more amount of the T3 and T4. So this iodide will then move from here into the colloid back. And then this iodide along with the tyrosine molecules present in the thyroglobulin, they will be utilized for the production of the thyroid hormones. In this way, these MIT and DIT, they provide twice as much amount of the iodide as compared to that provided by the iodide pump from the circulation into the colloid. The thyroid cell does not attack the iodinated thyronines, and, uh, but in the patients with the congenital absence of these iodotyrosine deiodinase, MIT and DIT appear in the urine and there are symptoms of the iodine deficiency. So there will be huge amount of the loss of the iodide from the body. So now thyroid gland. Thyroid gland is going to give rise to the production of this T3 and T4. But what we can see is primarily the most of the secretion is in the form of the T4, which is 80 micrograms. T3 is just 4 micrograms and uh, reverse T3 is 2 micrograms. But when it comes into the circulation and it reaches the target organs, there will be peripheral deiodination of this T4 into T3 to meet out the requirements of the body. So in a normal condition, MIT is 23%, DIT is 33% and we find that RT3 is very minor that is 2 micrograms per day. So when it reaches to the cell, to the target cells, their T4 will be converted into the T3 which is the most active form by the peripheral deiodination and there are practically there are essentially three types of the deiodinases in the body D1, D2 and D3. D1 and D2 are the 5 dash deiodinases that they will act on T4 to convert it into, R2, into T3 hormone and the D3 is a 5 deiodinase enzyme that converts T4 to RT3. 
So D1 is present in the thyroid, liver, kidney and this is responsible for the production of most of the T3 in the plasma. Whereas D2 is present in the pituitary, CNS, brown fat, local stores and D3 is present in the plasma and in the brain. So most of it will be produced by the peripheral deiodination. So now coming to the next question, what is the effect of the fasting on uh, and diet on the thyroid hormone synthesis and secretion? So when a person goes for the fasting or any form of the caloric restriction, body wants to conserve the energy and we know that thyroid hormones, they maintain the metabolism. So when a person goes into the fasting, there will be inhibition of the D1 enzyme. That means there will be lesser conversion of T4 to T3. So plasma T3 level is reduced 10 to 20% within one day and around 50% in roughly three to seven days. And so there will be decrease in the metabolic and the energy conservation will occur. During the more prolonged starvation, T3 will remain depressed for longer period of time. So when we take the basal metabolic rate and we check for the urinary nitrogen excretion, we find that BMR is also reduced and this urinary nitrogen exc excretion which is an index of the protein breakdown is also reduced. So these are the mechanisms to reduce the metabolic rate and conserve the calories. So now what, uh, how these circulate, these thyroid hormones circulate in the body? They circulate in, uh, in along with binding with the proteins and there are three major types of the plasma proteins. One is the thyroxine binding globulin, thyroxine binding prealbumin, and the albumin. Out of this, T4 binds to the thyroxine binding globulin or TBG most and TBPA, that is thyroxine binding prealbumin, whereas T3 has the affinity most to the albumin and to the TBG or thyroid binding globulin. Protein binding. Now, the, it is important to remember and understand that physiological actions are mediated only by the free form of the hormones because T3 and T4 can are, are present in the bound form as well as in the free form. So, the action will be mediated only by the free form of the hormones. T4 is highly protein bound. Total plasma concentration is roughly 8 micrograms per deciliter and roughly 99.98% is protein bound and less than 0.02% is free and uh, so and it th therefore it has a long T half of roughly 6 to 7 days. If you see T3 it is lesser bound it is 99.8% protein bound roughly 0.2% is free and the total plasma concentration is roughly 0.15 micrograms per deciliter. So since it is more, uh, it is less protein bound, it is more available for the action and therefore its T half also reduces to one day. So what is the significance of protein binding? Significance of protein binding is that it acts as a reservoir for the free hormones. Whenever there is utilization of the free hormones, the bound form can be made free to go into that free form and then it can be utilized. And it also prevents the metabolic degradation, sudden degradation of the free hormones. So T4 bound form will be decreased and uh, will, whenever there is an increase in the T4 bound form, for example, in pregnancy and in many condition, the, there is a transient decrease in the T3 forms, but uh, uh, transient decrease in the T4 or the T3 forms then this to maintain this T4, the thyroid stimulating hormone secreted by the anterior pituitary will further stimulate the synthesis and secretion of more amount of the hormones. And then again, thereby the balance will be reinstated and we find that the free level of the hormones will always be maintained. So there will be a new equilibrium with a higher total hormone and normal free hormone levels in the person. So the person will remain U thyroid. Now coming to the regulation of the thyroid hormone secretion. Hypothalamus secretes the thyrotropin releasing hormone that stimulates the anterior pituitary to cause the release of thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating uh, hormone TSH will act on the thyroid to cause the release of the T3 and T4 hormones. 
so these will mediate their impact or effect on to the body the metabolic effects will be created but when by the negative feedback regulation both at the level of the anterior pituitary or and at the level of the hypothalamus this free, free t3 and t4 will cause the negative feedback inhibition of their own synthesis so thyrotropin releasing hormone on trh it is secreted from the arcuate nucleus and the median eminence of the hypothalamus and uh, it acts on the thyrotropes it acts via the g protein coupled receptors and uh, the phospholipase c and inositol triphosphate or diacylglycerol pathway is utilized so thyroid stimulating hormone this is a glycoprotein roughly 211 amino acids tsh is secreted from the thyrotropes of the anterior pituitary from here and the average plasma level is roughly around 0.3 to 5 milli international units per liter and it controls the function of the thyroid gland tsh is going to, uh, it has tsh has two components alpha and beta subunits when they combine together tsh becomes active and it has a half life of roughly 1 hour so thyroid stimulating hormone the specific property is that this uh, these are released from the thyrotropes it has both alpha and the beta subunits but the alpha subunit of tsh is identical to the alpha subunit of the luteinizing hormone follicular stimulating hormone and the hcg alpha and the functional specificity of the tsh is conferred by its beta subunit so this explains why placental tumors can give rise to the hyperthyroidism so tsh as we have just discussed it is made up of alpha and the beta subunits tsh alpha and beta become non covalently linked in the thyrotropes and their alpha subunit is identical to that of lh fsh and hcg so when there is an increase in the level of the hcg and the alpha subunit of hcg is similar to that of the tsh alpha the large amounts of hcg can activate the thyroid receptors therefore in some patients with the benign or malignant placental tumors high plasma hcg levels can give rise to hyperthyroidism thyroid stimulating hormone it stimulates the thyroid hormone synthesis tsh receptor functions by the g protein coupled adenylyl cyclase pathway and it practically influences all the steps that we have discussed till now that is the iodide trapping organification coupling endocytosis of thyroglobulin then proteolysis of thyroglobulin and in the extreme cases in the pathological con conditions it can even cause the hyperplasia of the gland to cause the increase in the production of t3 and t4 hormones so now let us discuss about the mechanism of action of thyroid hormones the thyroid hormone receptors are similar to the steroid hormones however thyroid hormone receptors are in the nucleus not in the cytoplasm and t3 binds more rapidly and avidly to the thyroid receptors as compared to the t4 hormone so when we see this thyroid hormone receptor this has a central dna binding domain and it has a terminal ligand binding domain but in the resting state there is a co repressor that is present on the thyroid receptor so this thyroid receptor is bound to the this thyroid hormone responsive element and uh, in the enhancer region of the target regions along with the co repressors when there is stimulation via the tsh hormone released from anterior pituitary it acts on the tsh receptors on the thyroid gland tsh then thyroid gland will cause the release of t3 and t4 hormones that move into the target cells and via the transporter they reach to their target cell after entering the cell they will be acted upon by d1 and d2 enzyme then t4 will be converted to t3 peripheral conversion will occur and then further degradation process might occur so this t3 which is formed is now the active form that will then move from the cytoplasm to the nucleus 
and it binds with the ligand binding domain. So when T3 binds with the ligand binding domain of thyroid receptors, it heterodimerizes with the retinoid X receptor. And therefore, that brings about the unconformational change within the receptor. And in that way, the core repressor is released. And we find that the co-activator which is present within the nucleus will be now binding to the thyroid receptor. So when this binds, that causes, that causes the increase in the activity of the thyroid receptors, there will be the activity of the DNA. The conformational change will bring about the responsive element changes, the gene, there will be the transcription process, messenger RNAs will be produced and then that will take, then that will give rise to the translation process leading to the production of the proteins that will mediate the effect of thyroid hormone and we will find all the metabolic effects that we have discussed. Only T3 can transcribe genetic changes and T4 is nearly ineffective in transcribing genes. So the main effect is over here produced by the T3 hormone rather than the T4 hormone. Then there is also one non-genomic action which is minor action which does not take much of the time and the thyroid hormone acts on the cell membrane itself to enhance the entry of glucose, amino acids and on the mitochondria as well that will also cause an increase in the oxygen consumption and due to which we find that there is an increase in the metabolic activity immediately after the action of the thyroid hormones. These effects are primarily observed in the heart, muscles, fat and the pituitary gland. But over here, T4 is equipotent to T3 in the non-genomic action as compared to the genomic action where T3 is much much more potent as compared to T4. Now coming to what are the physiological actions of the thyroid hormones. The physiological actions, number one action is that it maintains the basal metabolic rate of the body. So it has the calorigenic action, it increases the oxygen consumption within the body. Then it is also instrumental along with the other hormones like the growth hormone and other hormones which are there at the time of the puberty. It orchestrates the pubertal changes that occurs and is also responsible for the growth and development of the adolescents. Then it is important part of the intermediary metabolism that is the carbohydrate, lipid and protein metabolism. And if you see in a, one effect is that it shifts the hemoglobin dissociation curve to the right by causing an increase in the 2,3 DPG. So now let's discuss about the physiological actions of the thyroid hormones. First and foremost is the basal metabolism. It is thyroid hormone is responsible for the maintenance of the basal metabolism. It does so by causing an increase in the oxygen consumption in all the metabolically active tissues of the body. There are a few exceptions like anterior pituitary, gonads, adult brain, spleen, lymph node and uterus. The mechanisms are number one, it enhances the sodium potassium ATPase pump activity and it causes increased mobilization of the fatty acids. It also causes increase in the synthesis of the mitochondrial cytochromes. It increases the synthesis of uncoupling proteins UCP1 and this thereby increases when the higher levels of the thyroid hormones are there in the body. It can increase the basal metabolic rate even up to the 80%. So effects secondary to calorigenesis or increased oxygen consumption are it enhances the nitrogen excretion that is it causes negative nitrogen balance. However, temporarily it causes a positive effect on the nitrogen balance in the hypothyroid children. When we give thyroid hormones then it primarily it causes an increase in the growth but they overall it causes the nitrogen excretion in the long run. So it will promote the weight loss due to increased metabolism, increased resting body temperature, decreased peripheral resistance because there will be cutaneous vasodilatation and it also causes the vitamin deficiency. Thyroid hormone is necessary for the hepatic conversion of the carotene to the vitamin A. 
so when there is hypothyroidism there will be the accumulation of the carotene and that causes the carotenemia and carotenemia can be identified by the yellowish tint of the skin skin normally contains a variety of proteins combined with the polysaccharides hyaluronic acid and the chondroitin sulfuric acid but in the case of the hypothyroidism what happens that these complexes accumulate promote water retention and the characteristic puffiness of the skin occurs that is called as myxedema this condition is called as myxedema so thyroid hormones when they give are given they metabolize these proteins and diuresis continues until the myxedema clears up so if we give thyroid hormone then this myxedema clears up role in the growth and the development thyroid hormone is necessary for a normal rate of the growth hormone secretion and the maintenance of the basal growth hormone levels thyroid hormone action is permissive to that of the growth hormone and it causes the potentiation of the actions of the somatomedins so thyroid hormone will interact especially at the time of the puberty with the sex steroids growth hormone and the insulin like growth factor 1 or somatomedins to cause the growth spurt at the time of puberty and the effects are widespread on the ossification of the cartilage the growth of the teeth the contours of the face and the proportions of the body so it will promote the expression of the growth hormone gene it causes stimulation of the linear bone growth endochondrial ossification and maturation of the epiphyseal centers increased osteoid activity and the bone remodeling eruption and development of teeth promotes the epidermal growth of the nails and hairs synthesis of the structural and enzymatic proteins and as we have just studied in tissues it causes the alteration in the characteristics of the mucopolysaccharide coming to the central nervous system it promotes the differentiation and the maturation of the brain cells especially during the infant and uh, infancy and the childhood period proliferation of the axons and branching of dendrites release of the neurotransmitter myelination of the neurons synthesis of the proteins and various enzymes and the cell migrations that is essential during the development and it also uh, is responsible for the speed and the amplitude of the stretch reflexes and for the memory learning and the intellectual capacities thyroid hormone is essential so many effects are due to the increased responsiveness to the catecholamines catecholamines are active only in the presence of the thyroid hormones so the when there is hypothyroidism then the most affected areas within the central nervous system or the brain are the basal ganglia cerebral cortex and the cochlea and the deficiency of thyroid hormone during the childhood causes the mental retardation deaf mutism and the muscle rigidity coming to the cardiovascular system it thyroid hormone causes an increase in the heart rate due to an increase in the number and the sensitivity of the beta receptors it also causes an increase in the inotropic effect by causing an increase in the alpha mhc gene expression which has higher level of atpase activity it increases the expression of the beta receptors it enhances the activity of the sodium potassium atpase and the calcium potassium calcium atpase pump it increases the cardiac output by causing an increase in the systolic blood pressure although there is increase in the systolic blood pressure the diastolic blood pressure may be decreased it is so because there is a higher body temperature that may lead to the cutaneous vasodilatation and so that leads to the decreased peripheral vascular resistance and due to the increase in the systolic and a decrease in the diastolic blood pressure pulse pressure is increased in the case of the hyperthyroidism it might also lead to the tachycardia when it is present in the higher levels since we need the higher amount of the oxygen intake so there will be increase in the respiratory rate oxygen consumption is enhanced ventilatory responses are enhanced and it causes an increase in the erythropoiesis coming to the metabolism so carbohydrate it is mainly diabetogenic so it will cause gluconeogenesis it promotes the glycogenolysis and that will that will increase the glucose output from the liver it also enhances the glucose absorption utilization and production ultimately increasing the insulin resistance 
so it enhances the glucose absorption from the GIT. In the fat, it is lipolytic in nature. So it causes the synthesis, oxidation and the excretion of the cholesterol. The net effect is that the thyroid hormone causes a decrease in the plasma cholesterol. So when a person is hypothyroid, one of the characteristic features is that there can be the hypercholesterolemia or the lipid parameters are going to be enhanced. Then coming to the proteins, there is proteolysis that is there is negative nitrogen balance. In GIT, it enhances the motility, it increases the appetite of the person, the food intake is increased and reabsorption of glucose is increased. In spite of that, the weight loss keeps occurring because the metabolic rate is much higher. In the skeletal muscle, it again causes gene expression changes. It changes the, it increases the MHC gene expression. So the characteristic thing is that when the hyperthyroidism is there, there is thyrotoxic myopathy. That is the proximal myopathy. It occurs due to increased negative nitrogen balance, protein catabolism. And on the other hand, hypothyroidism will also cause muscle weakness, cramps and the stiffness. Reproduction. In females, it is responsible for the follicular maturation and the ovulation and for the maintenance of the regular menstrual cycle. In males, it promotes the spermatogenesis, differentiation of the prepubertal cytoly cells and in the kidney, it causes increase in the blood flow and the GFR. It enhances the reabsorption of the electrolytes, glucose and water from the kidney. So it is important to understand its relation to the catecholamines. Catecholamines, as we all know, they will increase the basal metabolic rate. They will increase the, they will cause an increase in the cardiovascular system and the CNS effects similar to the thyroid hormones. So the effect is permissive. The thyroid hormones, they permit the action of the catecholamines. So when there is hyperthyroidism, in the, there are enhanced CBS effects, tremor and sweating are produced due to the increase in the sympathetic activity and uh, these can be decreased by the sympathectomy or the beta blockers. So there is increased expression of the catecholamine receptors throughout the body due to which the catecholamine action will be enhanced and uh, the person will have more of the sympathetic activity. Now let us discuss about the briefly thyroid dysfunctions. We can divide them into the hypothyroidism when the thyroid hormone activity is less or hyperthyroidism when the thyroid hormone activity is more in the body. Now coming to the clinical condition called as hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism means that there is thyroid hormone deficiency. It is less than the normal physiological limit. And this disorder is second only to the diabetes mellitus as the endocrine disorder. This is more common in females. It is called as myxedema in adults and in children it represents itself as the congenital hypothyroidism or also called as cretinism. Congenital hypothyroidism. In this condition, the children are hypothyroid right from the birth or before. The clinical features include that they are dwarf in stature, mentally retarded, they have pot bellies and enlarged protruding tongue. Worldwide congenital hypothyroidism is one of the most common causes of preventable mental retardation. There can be multiple causes. One of the most common causes severe maternal iodine deficiency. The other causes include fetal thyroid dysgenesis, inborn errors of thyroid hormone synthesis and fetal hypopituitary hypothyroidism. The features are infantile and the stature is dwarf. It is also essential to understand the difference because both the pituitary hyposecretion and that is mainly by the growth hormone and the thyroid hormone hyposecretion both can lead to the dwarfism. But the difference is that a pituitary dwarf will have the features consistent with their chronologic age until puberty. Since they do not mature sexually, they have juvenile features in the adulthood and they have the normal intelligence level. Whereas a thyroid dwarf the child is dwarfed and have the infantile features and one of the common features is that there is mental retardation and there may be other accompanied abnormalities. So what can be the etiology briefly? The primary hypothyroidism can be due to iodine deficiency. Another common thing is the autoimmune is 
Hashimoto's and the atrophic thyroiditis. There can be other causes like hydrogenic or can be due to the drugs. It can be due to the congenital hypothyroidism or it can be due to it can be idiopathic also and infiltrative disorders like the sarcoidosis, amyloidosis and hemochromatosis may also lead to the hypothyroidism. Thyroid does not respond to a test dose of TSH. This is how we differentiate, how we find out about the hypothyroidism. So secondary hypothyroidism, how does it occur? It can be due to multiple causes like the hypopituitarism or the eyes. We can have all these types of various conditions. The important way to differentiate it from the primary hypothyroidism is that thyroid responds to the test dose of TSH hormone. In the tertiary hypothyroidism, the disorder is at the level of the hypothalamus and we can differentiate it that the thyroid will respond to the test dose of the TSH. And there is a rise in the plasma TSH following a test dose of TRH or the thyrotropin releasing hormone also. So we can have the, uh, the disorders at the multiple levels and we can differentiate it by the measuring the thyroid hormone levels and also the TSH or the TRH levels. So what is the pathophysiology of the hypothyroid goiter? If there is iodine deficiency, the lack of the iodine will cause incessant stimulation of the thyroid stimulating hormone release from the anterior pituitary. And that will go and it will stimulate the thyroid gland and there will be increase in the thyroglobulin synthesis within the colloid. And that might look like a big hump that is So what is the pathophysiology of the hypothyroid goiter? What is the pathophysiology of hypothyroid goiter? In the iodine deficiency condition, the lack of the iodine prevents the production of the T3 and T4. So this causes via the positive feedback, there will be increase in the synthesis of TSH hormone from the anterior pituitary. So it will keep on stimulating the thyroid gland and that leads to the colloid accumulation in, in there is an increase in the thyroglobulin and the colloid accumulation and this will lead to the endemic colloid goiter. So the iodine deficiency is one of the common causes for the hypothyroidism. So that is why the policy of iodized salt is there and there is also the selenium supplementation and there are some goitrogens which I'll just briefly talk about they can also lead to the hypothyroidism. So the daily ingestion of the iodine is roughly 150 to 200 micrograms per day. And earlier we used to this national program of the salt iodization at rate of 100 micrograms per gram of the salt. But it was mandatory earlier, but today this mandatory rule has been withdrawn. Coming to briefly about the autoimmune thyroiditis. What and one of the commonest is this. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Autoimmune disease in which the thyroid gland is gradually destroyed and there is marked lymphocytic infiltration, there is atrophy of the thyroid follicles and there is absence of the colloid and the destruction of the thyroid gland itself. And uh, the incidence is more in the females as compared to that of the males. So the pathophysiology is that there are autoantibodies that are produced against the thyroid peroxidase enzyme, thyroglobulin and the TSH receptors. Therefore, the thyroid hormone release is inhibited, even the synthesis is inhibited and there is ultimately the destruction of the gland and there is a female preponderance. There is presence of the Herthal cells which are the thyroid cells with the abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm that is one of the characteristic features. So there will be the presence of the TSH R blocking antibodies will be there. Due to the presence of this, we find that there will be decrease in the T3 levels that keeps on stimulating the TSH production from the anterior pituitary, but it is not able to affect. And this leads to the condition of the thyro, thyro, thyrotoxicosis. Thyroglobulin antibodies are present in the early stage and thyroid peroxidase antibodies are present in the late state. So this is the mnemonic that we use to remember the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, all the symptoms. It is 
hypothyroidism autoimmune syn thyroid is used as a treatment herthal cell change occurs initial hashi toxicosis marginal zone nhl goiter it leads to tpo and anti thyroglobulin antibodies are present and lymphocytic infiltrate is present so there can be the iatrogenic and there can be also the idiopathic cause for the hypothyroidism so the clinical features briefly we have already discussed but let's see cardiovascular there will be decreased ventricular contractility decreased heart rate there will be decreased concentration lack of interest depression it might also lead to a special condition called as the mixed edema madness and the in the gastrointestinal tract it will lead to the decreased motility and it might also lead to the constipation there can be the delayed reflex delayed relaxation of the muscles the extremities may be cold and may also promote the carpal tunnel syndrome in the reproductive system it might promote the menorrhagia because of the alteration of the or patho pathology of the menstrual cycle and in the skin it might lead to the mexedema in lungs shortness of breath and pleural effusion and generally speaking the patient is going to have fatigue feeling cold all the time the weight gain might occur even with the poor appetite and the hair loss can also occur psychologically the poor memory and the concentration and poor hearing <clears throat> in the hepatic there can be an increase in the ldl uh, and the total cholesterol ratio there may be the increase in the ldl and triglycerides and a high serum cholesterol is present so again a small note on the mixedema there is thickness and dryness of the skin dry coarse hair alopecia loss of the scalp hair and or the lateral eyebrow hair are lost carotinemia due to the non conversion of carotene to vitamin a and the retarded nail growth may occur so there is accumulation of the dermal glyco glycosaminoglycans and these accumulate they promote the water retention and this is called as the mixedema so there can be also it hypothyroidism can also be due to another condition like the thyroid hormone receptor resistance where there is mutation within the hdr beta gene and the resistance to the effects of the thyroid hormones due to the abnormality of the receptors itself so clinically the t3 and t4 will be raised and tsh will be highly raised so that is and there that is non suppressible exogenous thyroid hormone coming to next condition hyperthyroidism it is generally it is used interchangeably with the thyrotoxicosis but hyperthyroidism means due it is due to the excess productive production of thyroid hormones by the thyroid gland and thyrotoxicosis is the condition that occurs due to the excessive thyroid hormone of any cause so thyrotoxicosis it includes the hyperthyroidism so what is the etiology of hyperthyroidism so it can be that there is a rise in the basal metabolic rate from plus 10 to as high as plus 100 we can see it is due to the thyroid overactivity or it can be due to the extra thyroidal origin of the pathology so the one of the reasons for thyroid overactivity can be the graves disease which is one of the commonest cause of the hyperthyroidism 60 to 80% cause here again female preponderance is there there can be multiple causes like the solitary toxic adenoma toxic multinodular goiter or tsh secreting pituitary tumors and it can be due to the mutations and ultimately the pathology is that there is constitutive activation of the tsh receptor onto the thyroid gland that means the receptors which are present onto the thyroid gland they are going to be stimulated all the times they can be become activated by the auto antibodies extra thyroidal administration of the t3 or t4 which is the iatrogenic or it can be factitious and it can be also due to the ectopic thyroid tissue in some other area that keeps on stimulating or production of the t3 or t4 hormone coming to graves disease it is also called as the toxic diffuse goiter it is an autoimmune disease that results in an enlarged thyroid and it is 7 and 1/2 times more common in females than in the males and usual the occurrence occurs in the 40 to 60 years of age 
and the classical features include the enlarged thyroid gland that is called as the goiter and the graves of thalmopathy or involvement of the eyes. So etiopathogenesis of Graves' disease is that the antibodies to the receptors for the thyroid stimulating hormone are produced and they will keep on stimulating these thyroid hormone synthesis from the thyroid gland and so these are going to be constitutively active and uh, there will be increase in the T3 and T4 levels and because of a very high level of the T3, T4 there will be negative feedback inhibition of the TSH from the anterior pituitary. So overall there will be an increase in the autoantibodies stimulated stimulatory TSH receptor response that causes an increase in the T3 and T4 hormones. So high thyroid hormone levels and very low TSH levels. Antibodies are produced to the thyroglobulin TPO and T3 and T4 may also be produced. So thyroid gland and the extraocular muscles they share some common antigens recognized by the TSH are stimulatory antibodies and therefore we find that there is ophthalmopathy also accompanied with the thyroid gland uh, pathology. So due to this these antibodies will also act with the ophthalmic tissue and that leads to the swelling of the tissues in the orbits producing the protrusion of the eyeballs that is one of the classical features of the Graves disease. In case of uh, hyperthyroidism, we give various drugs and these are called as the thyroid inhibitors. The group 1 are those drugs that inhibit the hormone synthesis which are also called as the anti-thyroid drugs and the major ones are the propylthiouracil, methimazole and the carbimazole. The mechanism of action is that these drugs bind to the thyroid peroxidase enzyme and prevents the oxidation of the iodide. It also inhibits the iodination and it also inhibits the coupling process. Specifically for propyl thiouracil, it inhibits the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3 hormone by the inhibition of D1 enzyme. So second group is those that inhibit the diodide trapping. These are called as the ionic inhibitors. These include thiocyanates, perchlorates and nitrates. So group 1 and group 2 agents are together called as goitrogens also. Coming to the goitrogenic food, so these include the cruciferous vegetables. They work exactly like these goitrogen agents and these include cabbage, cauliflower, bok choy, broccoli, brussels sprouts, canola etc. And if there is an excessive consumption of these cruciferous vegetables, it might lead to a decrease in the T3 and T4 hormone release from the thyroid gland and ultimately leading to the hypothyroidism features. Thyroid inhibitors third group is the those that inhibit the hormone release that include iodine itself, iodides of sodium, potassium, organic iodide and these are the fastest acting form of the thyroid inhibitors. So there is a condition called as the thyroid constipation or the wolf chaikoff effect. Let's read see what it is. So when large doses of the iodides are given, they produce mild and transient inhibition of the organic binding of the iodide and also the release of the synthesized hormone. So there is no release of the uh, hormone from the gland and it is due to the redox potential changes within the cell itself. So it is given usually in the pre-operative pre preparation of the thyroidectomy. So it will reduce both the size and as well as the vascularity of the gland. It can also be given in the thyroid storm where the Lugol's iodine is used as one of the inhibitors. Fourth class is those drugs that destroy the thyroid tissue. They include the radioactive iodine isotopes which are used to, to in these hyper, these are usually used in the Graves disease. So let's summarize what we have discussed that although the thyroid gland is not essential but it maintains the level of the metabolism for the optimal functioning of the body. Both excess and the lower levels of the iodine can severely affect the thyroid function. Thyroid hormone action is similar to the steroid hormones however receptors are located in the nucleus. Graves disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism and Hashimoto's thyroiditis and iodine deficiency are the most common cause of hypothyroidism. Thank you very much for the patient listening 
and seeing this lecture